There's that too. Because we have one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Jesse, David, uh, you, you, Tina, Alice. Me. We have only Rob, seven, of course. Seven, seven person. And is eight the quorum now? I don't know. I'm ask, uh, Janine, what is the quorum now? Um, I think it's eight. Let me just double check. I'm sorry. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, no, seven's quorum, so we're good. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to the March meeting of CB4's Transportation Planning Committee. I'm Dale Corvino, co chair, and Christine Berte is also a co chair. And uh, we're going to go through the end. This meeting, as you are aware, since you're here, went was originally scheduled for in person, but went back to virtual uh, for this month. So we are following the guidelines of New York State <clears throat> in that regard. Um, so first up, we're going to have a presentation and a vote on um, Chelsea Piers and just a little background. Um, Chelsea Piers is a um, large facility in our district, which uh, operates under uh, a number of different um, in another a number of different uh, area channels, uh, production spaces, gym, public public amenities, and so on. And they are um, um, soon to renew their lease. So we're looking at some um, potential improvements to the pedestrian. Uh, experience at Chelsea Piers. And David, are you leading the presentation? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to give you an overview of um, okay. what's been going on at the Piers. And then our traffic engineers from ACOM are available to answer any technical questions, and I can answer any use. Okay, so we have David Tewksbury from the Chelsea Piers to, to get us started. Okay. And Janine, Janine, you have David's material? Um, no, I didn't get the, the presentation, but you can share your screen. Oh, okay. It's just really, it's a narrative until, um, it, we, we'll share the screen. Anne -Marie, does Anne-Marie have access to the screen? Yes, she should. Great. Yeah. Okay. So uh, thank you, Dale. As Dale sure. said, my name is David Tewksbury. I'm one of the founders of Chelsea Piers. And I've been act engaged in managing the business and the site operations for the last 25 years. Thanks for allowing us the opportunity to discuss public access at Chelsea Piers between 17th and 23rd Streets. I'd also like to thank those of you who were able to take the Chelsea Piers tour, site tour yesterday afternoon. We received valuable input and ideas on possible pedestrian safety and access improvements. And we've asked our traffic and pedestrian safety advisors to tell us what's feasible and what is not. We agree with a pedestrian first approach and we'll address some of the suggestions in a few minutes. Just so you know, access and circulation have always been critical issues for Chelsea Piers. When we first opened, common thinking was no one will go there because of the remote location across that dangerous highway. Fortunately, people did come and we've been one of the most visited places in New York City for the past 25 years. People arrive by all modes of transportation, including walking, bikes, skateboards, scooters, private cars, taxis and Ubers, vans, small buses, the M23 and M14 buses, large motor coaches, and even on occasion by boat. Total visitation pre-COVID was approximately 4 million people a year. Before we review the proposed public access improvements or try to answer questions like, why can't you eliminate a lane on the service road or why do you need on-site parking? It's important to understand the scope and intensity of the diverse activities and uses that have existed at Chelsea Piers for the past 25 years. This is a very simplified site plan that describes the principal uses at the piers. 
One of our largest uh, and most active businesses is the Harbor Cruise business. Spirit Cruises is the largest dinner boat fleet operator in the United States and their New York City location is their largest, currently seven vessels. In addition to Spirit Cruises, Classic Harbor Line sells five vessels from Chelsea Piers and we have three to four independent charter operators. The guest flow for these cruises range from an architectural cruise for 40 at 9 a.m. in the morning to 400 seniors for a cruise at lunch to sunset cruises and senior proms at night. The guests arrive by all modes of transportation and it changes every day. Between April and November, these water-based cruises will often handle two to three thousand guests a day. A large majority of these guests are at Chelsea Piers in the evenings and on the weekends. The second, that's our first major business activity. The second major thing happening is sports and recreation, which is what we're known for. Chelsea Piers has five of the largest sports venues in the country. Four of them, the golf range, fitness clubs, ice rinks, and field house are owned and operated by Chelsea Piers. And the fifth, Bullmore, is a tenant. These sports businesses operate 16 to 20 hours a day and are rarely ever closed. On an average day, 5,000 people will come to Chelsea Piers to practice play or just get some exercise. We have a huge array of both youth and adult programming and run several large competitive leagues in soccer, basketball, and ice hockey. Teams and individuals travel to and from the piers by all modes of transportation and are often traveling as a family or lugging some sports equipment like hockey bags or golf clubs. Our peak hours at the sports facilities are generally 3.30 p.m. to midnight during the week and 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. on weekends. And I would say most of these guests are regular repeat visitors. They live in the city and Chelsea Piers is part of their daily and weekly schedule. The third major business is banquet and events. Pier 60 um, run, run by the Abigail Kirsch family operates three very active event spaces at Chelsea Piers. On a busy evening, they will host between 1200 to 1500 guests. Food and event supplies are delivered six days a week. Cleanup and refuse removal occurs in the late evening and AM hours every day. Most importantly, one, you know, roughly a thousand plus individuals arrive by various modes of transportation, usually between the hours of six or 7 p.m. and then depart at the conclusion of the events, usually between 10 and 11 p.m., again, by all modes of transportation. In addition to the large catered events, all of the sports facilities at Chelsea Airs host a wide variety of events. In a typical year, Chelsea Piers will host 2,000 kid birthday parties, mostly at the Fieldhouse, Sky Rink, and Bowling, and 1,000 special events, ranging from small golf groups of four to six, four to eight people, to corporate team building of 50 to 150, to an after-school skating party of 300 at Sky Rink. Most events are scheduled for weekday afternoons, evenings, and weekend days and evenings. The last major business is the studio business where we have three large studio production facilities, one on Pier 59, one on Pier 60, and one on Pier 61. Law and Order Special Victims Unit and the show Blacklist are produced in studios one and two, which you can see on the plan. The, um, Third uh, studio, Studio 3, is occupied by Pier 59 Studios, which is widely recognized as the world's largest fashion ph photography and video um, studio. These production facilities are constantly loading sets, lighting, wardrobe, materials, equipment in and out of the studios. The ability to also shoot on location in New York City is one of the principal reasons why they like Chelsea Piers. They basically move their production in and out of the studios every week. Support vehicles, including some large trucks are needed for business. We put tight restrictions on the number and size of vehicles, but basic production requirements have to be accommodated. I've spent this time reviewing the uses of Chelsea Piers in order to understand, to, to help you understand why the service road was designed with three lanes, and why we have 300 parking spaces on site. 
you need to understand the incredible level of activity that occurs virtually every day at Chelsea Piers. We maintain a staff of 35 guest services personnel who basically spend 100% of their time managing pedestrian safety and site activity. We work extremely hard and with 25 years of operating experience, we know how challenging it is to get people in and out of Chelsea Piers when the site is busy. The, ser the service road and the internal circulation are key to successful site management. The proposed lease has many positive benefits to the park and the public. The Hudson River Park over the life of the lease cures over $800 million in rent and pilot payments, plus Chelsea Piers ongoing obligation to maintain the piles and piers in excellent condition. Our annual payments to the park now account for 25% of the park's operating budget. We believe that the community advances the mission of the park, which is to bring people to the water's edge. Pedestrians and joggers in the park will enjoy a dramatically improved and continuous waterfront path along the Hudson River between 17th and 23rd Streets. I'd like to quickly run you through the public access and park improvements that have been proposed. Our plan will reroute pedestrians and joggers from the front of the building on the service road to the waterfront, enabling the Hudson River Park to flow through and around Chelsea Piers. We have shared these plans with many in our community, particularly people who walk and run in the park, and they're, they're quite thrilled. The Pier 59, the Pier 57 Esplanade, Pier 59 connection, which is on the screen now, this is the big move. This is the one that moves northbound pedestrians and runners from the front of the building to a 35 foot wide continuous waterfront walkway from 17th and 18th streets all the way up to 22nd street and Chelsea Waterside Park. On the left-hand side of the screen and on the next slide, you'll see the new entrance portal. Visitors have the option of either taking the long road as many runners do and run around the perimeter of the piers or taking a shortcut through Pier 59. Both are great options. As you'll see in a minute, the route along the main um, north-south walkway is actually shorter than the service road sidewalk for anybody traveling to Chelsea Waterside Park. Inside the, uh, Emery, could you slide down two slides? Inside Pier 59, we are uh, demolishing the existing sidewalk and creating a passageway through the garage. Next slide, please. This is the entrance. The entrance is being increased from about 12 feet wide to 60 feet wide with a 30 foot wide glass entrance uh, area. And this is a view from the inside looking south toward Pier 57. We have parking stackers inside this area, which we are going to screen with some type of acceptable art form to the Hudson River Park Trust. Next slide. And at the north end of this uh, passageway, we are taking down a section of uh, what, what is currently a marina office. The slide down just a touch, Emery, to show the current image. And we're basically increasing the passageway opening from about 12 feet to 24 feet wide. So you'll have a, key, a clear passageway and a clear visual corridor um, as you enter Pier 59 and make your way to Pier 62. So what do you, excuse me, get to, get to the north side of Pier 59. That is where I think great things happen. And there's a 35 foot walkway that runs four city blocks up to Chelsea Waterside Park. This is a, a rendering. We're going to be resurfacing this walkway, putting in new park furniture, new landscaping, and there'll be new wayfinding signage that starts at uh, Pier 59 and the Pier 57 Esplanade connection and runs all the way northbound and then circles over to the Pier, uh, excuse me, the 22nd Street crosswalk. Next slide, please. At the Pier 62 entrance, we'll be uh, relocating the classic Harbor Line um, uh, ticket booth basically, and trying to remove obstructions from the entrance, adding wayfinding signage. And I think the most important thing that this image shows is if you look on the left-hand side, you see the green uh, waterfront walkway band along with 
uh, wayfinding lighting and signage that will start at the 22nd Street crosswalk, come westbound till it hits the waterfront esplanade, go all the way south um, to 17th Street, and then return to the Pier 57 esplanade. Slide down to the travel distance slide, please. The improvements have basically created a, a fabulous access point at Pier 59 and eliminated all the pinch points along the route. This is what I mentioned earlier, the distance uh, that a pedestrian or runner would travel who wish to get from uh, 17th Street to 22nd Street um, is actually less taking the waterfront passageway. And uh, our source of information is Google Maps. They can count the steps apparently. And could you go to the walkway width slide, please? Again, this is 35 foot wide pedestrian walkway, approximately 50% covered and open and 50% is wide open to the waterfront. So you have protection if the weather is inclement and this is open whenever the park is open and actually our hours are uh, longer than the park hours. So this is open whenever Chelsea Piers is open. Overall, we believe our proposal for improved public access makes sense and will deliver a larger, safer, and more enjoyable pedestrian and jogger pathway than a wider service road sidewalk on the highway side of the building. And since the service road is of great interest to members in the community, we should spend a few minutes reviewing what has been proposed. We are trying to take a pedestrian first approach. By dramatically improving the Pier 5759 waterfront connection with new pedestrian wayfinding signage, a very significant majority of pedestrians and runners heading north will now move along the waterfront from 17th to 22nd Street. For those who elect to continue due north on the service road sidewalk, we'll be removing Wherever possible, all obstructions on that sidewalk, ranging from the dozens of signposts to trash and recycling receptacles to graded tree pit grades. The sidewalk ranges in width from nine to 12 feet, and we will do our best to make sure that all of that width is available. At the 20th Street crosswalk, protective pedestrian safety bollards will be installed in the east and west lanes of the service road to create enlarged safety zones for pedestrians crossing at 20th Street, 20th Street. And based on an issue raised at yesterday's site tour, we will identify locations where existing non-used curb cuts can be removed and replaced with level sidewalks. We'll work to improve signaling and driver awareness at the three pier entrance and sidewalk intersections. We are adopting a more rigorous pedestrian safety and traffic management plan to make sure site safety is properly managed at all times, particularly during periods of high activity. And we will work with um, HRPT to identify possible locations of bike share stations in and adjacent to Chelsea Piers. There were also a number of suggested improvements in access and site safety that we're currently reviewing and studying. Um, one is to evaluate the safety of the pedestrian access across Route 9A at the 17th Street crosswalk, looking at signal timing, improved lighting, and perhaps pedestrian traffic safety managers. We're also uh, ready, willing, and able to review any comments on pedestrian wayfinding signage and make adjustments as appropriate. We've been, it's been suggested that we support the community board regarding any future Route 9A construction should New York State DOT ever wish to consider eliminating east side Route 9A street parking in favor of a large bike block. And it has been suggested that a possible enhancement to the uh, bikeway might be to install slender bollards subject to NYPD approval that may facilitate uh, safer bike travel on the bikeways by the piers. And we have also been looking at um, the possibility of better wayfinding signage for bikers who wish to visit Chelsea Piers. Right now you can access at 17th, 18th, 20th, 22nd and 24th, but we've been told that the directional signage uh, 
doesn't exist and we don't really communicate on that issue very well. So I would like to thank you for allowing me the time to speak and provide you with this information. And I and our traffic engineer are available um, and would welcome the opportunity to try to answer any questions. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much, David. I appreciate the tour yesterday and I appreciate this presentation. I'm gonna ask two kind of quick questions and then turn it over to Christine and then we'll open it up to the committee members before going to the public. And also I should say, do we have um, parks here? Hi, Hudson River Park Trust is here. Ella. Oh, um, hi. Yes. I'm Noreen Doyle. I'm the president of the park and Robert Atterbury, our and executive Robert vice president, well. are both on. I'm glad you're both here. I was actually asking about our parks committee um, because oh, we were sorry here. about that. No, it's not at all. I'm glad you had the opportunity to, to, um, to wave in. Um, okay, two quick questions, David. Um, you mentioned the the numbers for the event venues. Was that in the aggregate when you said twelve to fifteen hundred for all three spaces of the event venues? Those would be the three venues run by uh, Abigail Kirsch, the large banquet halls, not including um, uh, does not include things that may happen within the sports venues. Right, but that is the aggregate number for all yeah, three. Venues. Uh, okay. Generally, uh, the largest one will run 600 to 1,000 guests. The middle-sized one will, will run 250 to 450, and the smaller run one runs 150 to 300. Oh, okay, yeah, that was that was sort of what I was getting at. I, was, I was, wanted to understand the capacity of those venues. And then... They, um, they, they could peak out at about 2,000, Dale, but... Combined, uh, aggregate. Yeah. Okay, and then um, do you see um, on the frontage... Do you, do you currently see, having operated this facility for so long, do you see conflict points, current conflict points between pedestrians and cyclists? I know we noticed that there's like a bit of a choke on the north end in terms of width where the cyclists have to slow down, but do you, are there specific points that you can note that are points of conflict? I, between pedestrian and cyclist, no, because very few people ride their bikes on the sidewalk the principal conflicts are between pedestrians and the commercial activities that take place along that back side of the building of all types and the three um entrances to the um three pier buildings that that's uh, that's a conflicted area in terms of safety so the the conflicts are between the the people working in the principally in the studios and the event space and coming and going from parking and the pedestrians crossing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I should also say we have Jeffrey LaFrancois here, chair of uh, CB4. Okay, hi Jeffrey. Uh, okay, I will um, pass it to Christine and then we'll see if any of the committee members have additional questions. Yes, David, thank you for the tour yesterday. It was really, really helpful to see uh, to get the visual and the, per the perception of what's going on. That was, um, thank you, we are very gracious to do that and to give us all the information we ask. So we appreciate all of that. Um, I have a few questions. You mentioned the uh, 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 bollard. Uh, uh, where are those bollard going to be? Can you show us on the map? Um, yes. The, um... And Marie, can you pull up on the slide uh, deck, the service road slide at the end of the deck? These are in the ACOM report. This is, um, yeah. So on the, on the, uh, the top section of the, 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 the middle of the slide on the left-hand side uh, surrounded in red with a red dot in it, that is the pier 60 sidewalk crossing. So mm -hmm. we're basically going to recapture approximately, I'm going to guess it's roughly 20 feet on the um, the western lane and the eastern lane and install safety bollards to both um, provide better lines of sight for cars and pedestrians to see each other. And in the event there's larger queuing um, to prevent people from spilling onto the bikeway 
um, if that, that reservoir at the bikeway highway is very small. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I must be slow, but I understand where are the bollards and how they are going to be used. Where, where are they located, located exactly? Um, I want to take a, a shot at explaining exactly because I, they're located on the service road at the Pier 60 crosswalk. Yeah, but are they on the, on the, in the roadway? Yeah, in the roadway, in the east lane and the west lane to create a protect, protective reservoir so that basically a person crossing that crosswalk only has to worry about one lane of traffic to cross. All right, so this is kind of a neck down. Yes, I, I that's what's yes. called Ira, a neck how would down. You... I guess. Okay, I understand that. I think the goal uh, is the goal is sort of the east-west traffic for crossing the highway, allowing a bigger protective reservoir for a pedestrian trying to get across the highway or coming mm -hmm. this way to have an added space. Yeah, that's it's called it's I, I think it's called a neck down. I mean, I, we call it a neck down if so. Uh, Ira, what is ACOM called? What? Ira, you're on mute. We have our engineer from ACOM on the line. I, I, I'm having difficulty. J James, uh, I'm, I'm fading in and out. I'm sorry about that. We can hear you now. Yeah. Right. Yes, the yeah, the bollards as stated, they would be in in the roadway. Uh, Christina, as you were calling, it, neck down is the appropriate word here, um, just to, to kind of make sure that cars can't drive through that that area um, where people would be standing and waiting to cross, and to give them kind of uh, a shorter crossing distance in essence, yeah. so they only have to wait. Okay. Uh, yeah. As soon as you say neck down, I can translate. <laughs> um, and. Uh, the other question is you mentioned that you were going to address some curb cuts and I do appreciate you know being you being responsive to that. I think on the other uh, there are so many curb cuts on the northern side. It would really behoove everybody to if there are some curb cuts which are just for picking up uh, uh, trash and if they are not a loading dock, I mean it would really help to adjust to the size of what's needed and also to adjust to the normal ADA requirements, which is to make a flat surface for the pedestrian and then a slope to get in the street. And uh, these are, these are this accepted uh, and, and generally recommended ADA treatments and uh, that makes the walking on the sidewalk much more comfortable rather than being sloped all the time. So I would encourage you to look at all the curb cuts, reduce their width to make them consistent with, their, with the use. I mean, like, you know, if, you, if people are putting down just a, uh, uh, a container, a garbage container, then you don't need more than you know three feet or five feet or four feet. Right now they are very very wide. And then for those that you are not adjusted or, or for all of them, really uh, making the sidewalk flat and then slope just at the end on the last three feet. And I'm sure Icon and Sam Schwartz know what I'm talking about. Um, we will look at all the curb cuts and right. Uh, and I have to say, removing the trees is not my idea of uh, helping. We're just changing the grade from something that uh, is a little, un some of them are a little uh, uncomfortable to walk on to make them more comfortable to walk on. Not well, and then, and then some of them are covered by cement. And I think you should widen the sidewalk, the the tree pit, and then there is a treatment that put, that's get put on the top, which is a, uh, a it looks a little bit like compressed asphalt, and uh, it's has been very effective into letting the water go through, but giving a good you know a good uh, option for walking on it. So that because you know this whole area is is very sterile, 
and I don't know that you want to remove more things. Mm -hmm. um, now, which element of the plan are guaranteed? Because when I read the contract, it looked like the portal, uh, uh, the 59th Street modification were not all guaranteed. Okay, I want to um, minimize your minimize you right so it looks in the enhanced public access in it says the installation of pavers on the in the western walkway and pier 59 interior improvement are not guaranteed and the improvement to the pedestrian crossing inside like a raised crossing is not and the widening of the exterior entryway on pier 62 is not guaranteed. So it would be interesting to see on your map, on your presentation, what is committed by the contract and what is not. Uh, if you go back, uh, Emery, just go to the renderings. Uh, go to back to the first one. Okay, uh, everything we show you on these renderings, although design may change, you know, it's, it's subject to trust approval, the wayfinding signage may look different, you know, maybe there's a better way. Everything on this rendering is what we call um, base case work required by Chelsea Piers, 100% of what you say here. Okay. Go, go down to the interior, go down to the interior, uh, the port. Next slide, Emory. This next slide, one more. Yeah, again, final to show the exterior first. Uh, a lot of this was prepared off of the exterior portal. A lot of this was prepared off of um, schematic drawing. So final details may change, but a hundred percent of this new entrance portal is committed to as base work. A hundred percent work with the Pier Fifty Nine uh, passageway is committed to as base work. Go to the um, exterior walkway. This is committed to as base work. The exterior walkway, what is base work is uh, resurfacing with an acceptable surface material. And again, it could be a tennis court type material or some type of epoxy. The entire length of uh, the exterior and interior walkway from Pier 59 to Pier 62, new park furniture, new landscaping, New yeah, lighting. Yeah. Well, that, new I, don't want, I don't want to interrupt you, but I mean, let me read you the. Uh, the, no, the but summary. let me let me just, uh, Christine. Let okay. me finish. That's included. Go to the Pier sixty two slide. Okay, this is included too. Cleaning up the entrance, putting in wayfinding signage, um, new lighting along the pathway. What's optional at the trust discretion, and we're required to do a plan and have. Um, estimate for cost is to run park pavers, something probably more like what's on Pier 57 Esplanade along the entire walkway. So we haven't fully engineered this. The trust isn't sure if it makes sense or what the best material is, but that's an option. And I do think base work probably includes installation of a speed table where the, the walkways cross the garage, but I'm not 100% sure. Yes, it says that. Yeah, the other um, uh, trust directed item would be, do we take off the corner of the blue building that separates um, what we call the Sunset Strip interior from the exterior walkway and peel it back and create a grander opening? Um, and if, the, if you read through the lease, the cost of those improvements is, you know, probably the, those two additional optional improvements is you know probably in the two to two and a half million dollar range. We're required to pay the initial cost, and we would receive a rent credit um, for that cost after the work is completed over a right. period of seven, I think, seven years approximately. Okay. So the, basically, the trust has, I think, rationalized this by saying, "You do all the work, and if we're going to contribute anything, it's going to be part of the additional rent you're paying during that seven year period." I had another question, which is tangential to this discussion, but which is the lessee 
has 100,000 square feet of lessers available development right. Can you tell us what you're going to do, what you plan to do with that? Well, today we have about three to 400,000 square feet of potential development rights, uh, but the trust wanted to limit any future development on the site. It would most likely be used in conjunction with uh, expansion of studio uses, um, if they wanted to put in a mezzanine for production offices or things like that. Or if in one of our sports businesses, we need an additional training room or meeting space. You know, a lot of our ceiling heights range from 24 to 40 feet. So over the years, um, you know, we've installed several mezzanine and second level spaces at the piers and are likely to, you know, continue to do that in future years. And have you thought since yesterday about where to put the bike share? Well, I, we, I, I didn't pull out the report we had done pre-COVID, but, you know, the locations are out on the piers um, on, on either 60 or 61. Um, we could look at a, a one section of the service lane, uh, potentially, um, for a distance of about 40 feet. Um, we love the location at the north end of the fifth, Pier 57 Esplanada, though the trust hasn't... Um, I don't think accepted any right. bike share in the park yet. So I think we'll okay. require a discussion with the Hudson River Park Trust. Dale, I'll, I'll come back at the end. You may want yeah. to have other people. Sure. Um, and I just want to circle back to one thing that you mentioned with respect and how it uh, impacts the location of bike sharing facilities. So the park hours, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. And you said the, the walkway would be open to at least those hours, right? And sometimes yeah. more. Yeah, generally. Okay. I think the park so, hours are until 10 p.m. Yeah, the park hours are, are until 1 a.m. Oh, 1 a.m. Oh, great. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I was just reading off of Google. Okay. Um, Google's got it. Google hasn't been updated. Um, so 6 a.m. to 1 a.m. Whatever the park hours are, we keep the north south access open. I okay. didn't realize they were that long. I thought they closed the park at 10. So, so that. Depending on where bike sharing locations are, I mean, if obviously if they're park, if they're within the park, which I understand, you know, is a contention, they would be accessible during park hours. Well, I suppose it's the same. It's like, the same. Yeah, right. the, the, they're going to be city bike locations that are not fully twenty four hours accessible, in all likelihood. Just something to consider when we're uh, determining location. Yeah, okay. That's, that's yeah. Um, as far as like, you know, the operator, city bike, the operator informing users that they will not have continuous access. Okay. So I'm going to check with the committee members who has a hand up and then we'll go back to Christine before we, I don't see any hands up. Yeah. Oh, David. David, David, David Warren. Hi, good evening. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to remind everyone that this is the most used bike lane in North America. Um, you spoke about a walkway and relieving pedestrian congestion. What about cyclist congestion? I saw you put a, a, a walkway. What about adding a bikeway into that? Um, also, the other thing is I want to know how the Nick Downs will exactly affect um, cycling. Which neck down, David? The neck downs in, uh, on the on the roads. Didn't he say? It's oh, he's large, talking. He's talking about the the service road, not the. Yeah. Uh, so the bollards won't affect the won't be in the bike lane. No, no. Or the Jersey barriers, whatever those, because there are a bunch in in the bike lane before. I don't know about now. I haven't ridden that in a while. But. No, no, that's not the case. Okay, so but uh, what about? Um, since it is the most used bike lane in the country, what about, you know, some relieving of bicycle? You mentioned pedestrians, but what are you doing for the cyclists to relieve some of that congestion? I see that you have brought them almost, for lack of a better word, inside the uh, perimeters of the, of the pier, but will people be able to cycle there also? I don't think you're allowed to cycle in the park. I think you're supposed to dismount your bike. So right, that's an issue though. Right. It's the most congested. Um, 
David, uh, the bike line. Sorry. David, the bike line is the Greenway, and it's controlled by the U.S. DOT. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, State DOT. Okay. So the portion that, quote unquote, the the the, the Chelsea Pier leases is outside of that and it's not covering uh, the Greenway. Okay, yeah. the other thing, other thing I was gonna ask very quickly is, you, you mentioned motor car sec, uh, secure parking for, the, for cars. What about secure parking for cyclists? Do you, are you gonna offer cyclists who visit your facilities? If, let's say I bike to uh, a catering event at Pier 60, will there be secure bike parking for me? Well, our fitness club has a bike lockup that uh, the members use. And then throughout the piers, we have bike racks that individuals are free to use at any time if they must provide their own lock. And I haven't ever heard of any sort of 100% safe public bike um, locking facility because kids roll up with bolt cutters and somehow managed to ride off with people's bikes. Well, the Omni has something, a group called yeah. Omni, a private group has something that you might want to investigate for that. Yeah. And as far yeah, as the plans we'll do for the bikeway, there's really only two, two places I think we impacted significantly, or maybe three. One is we have always had a crossing uh, guard at the 22nd Street crosswalk to try to maintain peace between pedestrians, autos, and bikes, but creating the reservoir space at the pier uh, 22nd, excuse me, the 20th street sidewalk will keep pedestrians out of the bikeway as they wait for, or should keep, or will help keep them out of the bikeway while they're waiting for the traffic light to change. In the improved at pier 59 with the larger access way to the waterfront pathway should pull more runners to the waterfront, as opposed to occasionally we see them running on the bike path in that area, though not that often in that particular location. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go on to Biren and then Jeffrey. Yes, uh, thank you. I think quite a few points have been covered by Christine Bell and also David. Uh, one question that I'm gonna sort of reiterate is uh, David's question about how about extend, not actually adding one more bike lane, but the bike lane uh, parallel to Chelsea Piers is very tight. I ride my bike there every single day. You are negotiating between pedestrians and bicyclists at the same time. And bikes are kind of taking turns on 28th Street. How about actually enlarging the width of that particular stretch and utilizing some of, some of the service lane? Of the bike lane? Of the bike lane, yes. So right now, it's, I think yeah, we'd have to we'd have to address that to the state. All right. And the second question I'm going to ask you is that you're willing to take out trees and so-called obstructions from the sidewalk, which is along the service road, but you're not ex um, kind of extending that sidewalk itself, which is kind of a little problematic as far as I'm concerned. But the second question I'm asking you that uh, what you're giving us is not much more than what you already have on the waterfront side sidewalk. What the dimension is not being enlarged, if I'm correct. Am I correct about that? Yeah. No, but so the, it's, it's the basically access, giving you, you, you the, just the, 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 sorry, let me finish. The you, you access leaving? at Pier 57 Esplanade, which has been recently rebuilt as part of the Pier 57 project. Is, is is inadequate and people walk and run by it on a regular basis. The opening there, which is actually parallel to the sidewalk is only about 10 feet wide. The new access point will be 46 feet wide and there'll be significant wayfinding signage. People will naturally gravitate to the waterfront pathway because it's a much safer, nicer route. Not, not, not if you're a commuter walking down the sidewalk quickly to get to work. So uh, my, my whole question is, this is a very realistic sort of equation here, right? What are you giving us in return for what? The community. And if that sidewalk, you, you're just alleviating sort of pressure point or the pinch points. 
but you're not actually giving us anything more in terms of the width of the sidewalk. So that's one, one, one of the things that I want to put on the table for yeah, committee. The, the, the uh, reason I, I took the time to um, go over everything that happens at Chelsea Piers on a daily basis is that the service road is a vital part of our logistics and ability to run the site. We've run it for 25 years and we have very diverse and conflicting uses which bring people to the piers at all hours of the day, particularly in the afternoons and evenings. And if we take away part of that service road, our site starts to fail and the businesses start to fail and we would fail as a company and wouldn't be able to pay our rent. So what, what, what is your vehicle count per day? At peak hours, uh, vehicle can do about twenty. For your for your service road, the, the, the services that must be brought to Chelsea Piers, what is the compelling number that we run about? You to... We run about twenty six hundred uh, cars a day uh, through the service road. But are they the ones that are coming for parking, or are they the ones delivering? Approx goods approximately twenty percent of those stay and park and approximately 80% of those pick up and drop off. And this not include any of the service or delivery vehicles or the film and TV production vehicles. So the essential services is what percentage would that be? The goods and services, that's all I'm asking. Parking, you know, we're not gonna sort of make tremendous compromises for parking, but what are the goods and services percentage of vehicles coming in and out? And what time of the day, you know, if you could tell us. Uh, I, I, I would have to, Get back. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Well, that number is very critical to this conversation because even if you actually physically do not change the sort of nature of that service road, giving away a lane at a particular time of the day could be an option worth looking at. And that's what I'm proposing, that maybe the evening time or after 4 p.m., there are a lot more pedestrians walking in and out of that zone, and maybe one of the lanes can be made <coughs> available during that period or the times when you do not have very many service vehicles coming in and out. Um, okay. Not sure if you missed the beginning of the discussion, but basically the 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. time is our busiest time of day. Okay. Dale? Uh, Jeffrey, thank you, Viren. <clears throat> Thanks, Dale. Hi, everybody. Apologies, I couldn't join the tour yesterday. Just a couple of questions and a couple of points. Um, <clears throat> the scope of tonight's discussion is squarely on Chelsea Piers. And, um, you know, when we had the city bike infill discussion a couple of months ago, Chelsea Piers attended that meeting and, you know, raised significant interest in greater access for city bike docks in and around the piers, but did not offer um, any specific locations on the piers on their property or their leased property itself. And tonight we're hearing again a suggestion of space on the edge of Chelsea Piers, not actually on Chelsea Piers. So thinking again about the interest of these piers, the business operations at these piers, and how the interest is all around it for gain and not how that affects what happens in and on the piers. So I don't think we should consider- Jeffrey, if I may- seven as, I may, as I may a, stop as a if I may stop you, Jeffrey, in response well, you can, to except for the fact that there are two other locations within Hudson River Park where city in, bike docks exist. So I just want to, I just want to, sure, we could line, you know, the, the roadways north and south of the piers with city bike docks, but everybody has to shoulder um, some burden as it relates to a significantly and highly used mode of transit in and around the facility. Uh, I'm sorry, but you must have missed my response to Christine's question. I said the most logical locations, there were three spots within our leased premises. So you must have missed that. Right. And one of them was on the service road. And I was really happy to hear that that was, was on the table. I just wanted to note that Pier 57 is not a part of this discussion, nor that newly built and expanded Esplanade. Second yeah. to that this evening, um, you noted that the service road is a vital part of running the business operations for the pier. And so it made me think of um, the over highway infrastructure that's been built at 46th Street and at Chambers Street, which inconveniences pedestrians only to benefit 
private vehicles and the expeditious movement of private vehicles. Um, so again, the public is being asked to shoulder the burden to benefit private business here. Chelsea Pierce has been in existence for 25 years. Tonight, we have a crack at a lease that will not be up for re-entertainment for potentially 45 years. I may be dead by then. Many of us may be dead by then. And I would hope that business models would change in 45 years. And I am so confused as to why business models 25 years after the founding of Chelsea Piers have not modernized. Chelsea Piers has a website. In 1995, my guess is there was not a website. The, the sports facilities that are offered today inside the Piers probably are different than what was offered in 1995. So why again is the public expected to continue to shoulder the burden of a business model that doesn't conform to the needs of the public, the nature of the city, and in particular, the right sizing of fleets to both green and clean our environment. So the goods that Chelsea Piers offers to the public are significant and those are not at question today. The burden on the public is what the issue is. And the fact that we get one chance at this for potentially 45 years, it's rather alarming that business, which long often leads government in terms of, of innovation and improvement, is wants to just stay the same and that we should be expected to tolerate it. And, and that's what I've heard here tonight. Um, I see more hands up. Uh, Jesse. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, trying to wrap my, it, 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 you know, there's a lot of different um, issues at play here. Obviously a lot of different stakeholders. I'm trying to wrap my hand, head around what, uh, and Jeff, uh, Jeffrey, if we, if I could just hear a little bit more detail from you just about what some of the burdens are, or what, what are some of the other it, as we go into this next 40 year lease, what other concessions we wanna extract? Because I do think for me at least that the, the expansion in the back is a, is a significant solution to a significant problem uh, in terms of overcrowding on that sidewalk. Uh, people will use it. People will prefer to run and walk along the water. Um, there are separate issues with the bike lane. Absolutely. And that can be addressed. That should be addressed elsewhere. Uh, your city bike issue is well heard. I think that we should be demanding, you know, more city bikes on, on the Chelsea Piers property. What are, beyond, but beyond the service road issue, are there, are there other, are there other issues that the community, uh, we have concerns over that we could put more emphasis on rather than just focusing on the, you know, or just being so, um, uh, um, laser focused on the, the sidewalk and the service road. I think the, I think the general overriding principle of, at least of this committee as, and maybe the board, as, you know, it ties into the principle of the board as a whole is that first we're, we're the transportation committee. So we're overwhelmingly concerned with the safety of um, pedestrians and cyclists. Um, but as a board, we're interested in um, seeing this you know, incredible and vast facility, which sits inside of a park, and that's the purview of another committee, which um, is um, working on this issue in tandem with us, feel more like a building inside of a park. And at the front of the building, it's not very park-like. And um, David's um, proposed changes to the rear walkway do kind of, are, are going towards like it's an interstitial connector between one part of the park, the north, the north side of the park and the south side of the park. And it could, you know, kind of be more park-like and it could be more parkified uh, based on the direction the design is taking, but it's still cutting through a privately run facility to connect two portions of the park. So I think that's the the overriding principles are like the, you know, the the conflict-free, um, to the degree possible, conflict-free um, enjoyment of pedestrians and cyclists, and also the a more park-like environment for this facility. Did I? Is that is that, can, a, fair, is that yeah, a fair yeah. consensus statement? Yeah, Dale. Can can I follow up on that? Sure. 
Jesse, it's it's um, there is a sense that there is a you know a possibility there, just like when we are on Eighth Avenue and we say we're going to take a lane, and everybody's like, "Whoa, we can't do it!" Right? And then we take the lane, and everything is okay. And we have a sense here that there is an opportunity to do very good for the Chelsea Piers so that they are front door in a sense, because that's their front door. Today, Chelsea Pier front door is essentially for cars. There is no front door for people, okay? So I think if we could enhance that and make that front part to look like a front part from people, it would be very good for Chelsea Piers and it would be very good for pedestrian, et cetera. And connected to that, so I think, I think that's the issue we have is that, you know, how do we take this operation to the next step where we have, to, what we have done for a lot of streets now in New York City. And, and, and we think it, uh, Janine, can you put on the, 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 the three or four slides that slapped together this afternoon? And it's not very sophisticated, sorry. <laughs> Can you share those slides? They look very small. Oh, okay, all right. So I think what we learn in the walk around is that a lot of the, the, the site, am I, oh, oh, I'm trying to, uh, a lot of the sites are used, you can see those, those trucks, which are trailers, and all those trailers are essentially used for the film business. Uh, David told us that most of the deliveries were done inside and there is one bus parking there. So the question is, it, it, go to the next slide. So this is the way it looks. You have huge trailers on both sides and you really have only one lane moving at some part of the day. I shouldn't say the whole part of the day, but at some part of the day. So go to the next slide and uh, Janine. And so one concept would be, let's take everything and put it on one side, you know? And if you were putting all that stuff on one side, which is on the west, on the east side, you would, you would have about 530 feet taken out of 1246. And the trucks are not much further than they are currently. So you could have all these trucks organized on the left side uh, and then the right side available to make, to do other things. So next slide. And that's what it could look like. You, you see on the south side, what you see here south, which is really the east side, you would have all the trucks on the east side. And then you could take a big portion of the, the, the lane, which is currently parking and extend it and plant trees and do all the good things we like to do and potentially install a city bike right next to the entrance. Okay. So that's, that's a concept and what we are trying to communicate here is that this should be really studied carefully and not just put your hands up and say, oh my God, the, the, you know, the sky is falling yeah. because it, it's not, it's, it's potentially viable. Now, it may not be completely viable, but our understanding is that the deliveries are inside and the film is here. There is also the option of taking some of that and putting it inside what I mean by fixed operation like they have. Mm -hmm. And so this, this mix could be, could be studied and it should be really studied seriously, not uh, rejected offhand, let's put it this way. Dale, you can take it back. Thank you for, thank you for that in, very in-depth. Uh, answer to my question. Seriously, uh, thank, you for, thank you for taking the time so that we're all on the same page of exactly it is, what, what the stakes are and what it is we're talking about. Yeah. Um, okay, Jesse, thank you, thank you for your question. Um, 
Christine, I have to move. It should take like less than 30 seconds, but in case I go off, it's my device. So um, will you bear with me while I move? And if, sure, absolutely. If, I, if I disappear, take over until I get back. <laughs> Do we have anybody to call on? Oh, again. Uh, I see beer in hand is also up. Yeah, I let me uh, have uh, Tina because she didn't speak yet. Um, Noreen, I will, you'll go next. <laughs> I know you have had your hand up. Sorry, Listen, just I just wanted to echo some of the points which actually were made by Jeffrey oh. and yourself. Okay, all right, Tina. Just as a follow up, Christine, as to what you said, because that diagram seems to take care of a lot of the problem of the trailers. Have we got a commitment from Chelsea Peers to take that diagram seriously and see if it will work? Not at all. Why not? Why, not? I, I'm... why was it rejected offhand? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, why is it rejected? I mean, when I walked by today, there was a big trailer. I mean, it looked basically, I see the same thing. So I'm curious why it's not being looked into. David, you want to address that? Yeah, uh, we're happy to, if you would email us that drawing, have the ACOM engineering firm look at it and respond. We did have them study removal of a service lane, both a east lane and a west lane. And their determination was outlined in the traffic study that we provided in that it would basically um, cause the service road to be dysfunctional given the heavy volumes of uh, different types of uses that take place throughout the week and throughout the year. But we're happy to look at it again. Maybe that's a little different. Yeah, David, the, the reality is like, you know, DOT has just removed nearly two lanes on 8th Avenue between Port Authority and Penn Station. And if you can think of something which is more crowded than that at all times of the day, it's not. So I think we need to get a little bit outside of our comfort zone and, um, and say, how can we make it work, you know, rather than uh, the traffic. I mean, you know, the traffic has a way of, of, of adjusting and, and, and I think it would be helpful to really look at it. Uh, Noreen. Thank you. Um, I just thought it would be a good moment to raise my hand to say that even though I know this is the Traffic and Transportation Committee and obviously expected the questions that are here tonight and I'm appreciating the discussion and as always the thought that goes into this from CB4, um, that in case there are members here that don't really know why we're talking about some of this, I just wanted to do it two minute kind of overview that the Chelsea Piers has an existing lease with us that goes for another 21 more years. So the trust does not have the authority to do force any of these changes or anything like this, or for that matter, the, the, the commitments that they've already made um, without the new lease. I think most of you know that, but it's worth saying that. Um, when Chelsea Piers approached us about a new lease, we looked at it um, as an opportunity to try to negotiate betterments for the public, which means the park. It's the two, two things from our perspective. And as we've talked about this publicly previously, um, you know, clearly we knew going into this that public access improvements were one of the benefit areas that we wanted to try to achieve. Um, we knew that people would ask about the most heavily used bikeway in the United States and the esplanade and the sidewalk and the everything else like that. And we um, began, some of you have heard this already also with many of the questions that you've had about, can't we eliminate a service road lane? Can't we whatever? I love this discussion for helping us all make sure that we've explored all paths. Um, but I also think that the general principle of separating pedestrians and bringing them to the water's edge is something that we've tried to do throughout the park. Um, we mostly try not to have pedestrian paths right next to the bikeway, um, certainly not right next to our driveways where possible. There are other difficult places in the park and bringing people to the water, I do think is a betterment. And I'll just say that. There are other benefits here. Um, there's some criticism about the private business making money just as a reminder, 
Hudson River Park, whether we like it or not collectively, is a financially self-supporting park. And so there is a public benefit from the rent that they pay us. And there is a need for us to have the tenant, whichever tenant, be able to function within also rules that we establish, right? So it's not anything goes, but it's also like we have to allow the business that is approved to be able to work. And again, this discussion is really helpful, I think, for testing, poking, everything like that, that is supposed to happen in a public process. So, you know, no objection to that, but I do think that the rent that Chelsea Pierce pays has a benefit for overall Hudson River Park, all the open spaces that we maintain without the commercial uses. And then last, and this has been discussed to a degree with the Waterfront Committee, the lease that we inherited has very, very few protections with respect to uses, um, for example, or rebuild requirements in casualty situations, or not even a minimum standard for the sports part that is part of the Chelsea Piers name. Um, so we negotiated a lot for caps on certain things, minimums on certain things, so that if the lease is approved at some point, there is a recognizable Chelsea Piers um, with whatever other improvements can happen, sure, but a recognizable business over the long term rather than something that has no sports in it or all event space or whatever. So I just wanted to kind of recap for the group that um, fully appreciating the public access discussion is the topic of the day here. From the park's perspective, we had those other realms of public benefits that we were also exploring. Thank you. Um, thanks, I appreciate your comments. And I don't think anybody here wants to clip Chelsea Beer's wings. We want them to be a successful and multi you know, multi-purpose, multi-pronged operation, but, you know, we're advocating for the public interest and um, we would love to see the site as parkified, if that's a word, as possible. I'm gonna go to David Solnick because he hasn't had an opportunity to speak and then I'll go back to uh, Viren for a double dip. David. Yeah. Hi, um, I just wanted to comment on the material that was proposed for the new walkway, the new widened walkway versus um, versus the service road. Um, if, if, I, if I remember correctly, and if I saw correctly in the photo, the service road has these wonderful stone pavers. And what's, so the cars get stone pavers and what's proposed for the new walkway is basically paint. Um, I think that's, backwards. Um, obviously, no reason to take the pavers out of the service road, but the material, the material on a, on a, on a walkway or on any kind of, you know, accessible um, surface sends a very strong message. Um, and, you know, if, if, uh, uh, you know, if, if it's just paint, it sends the message of that this is, you know, this is a less important space. This is the less space, space that we've, you know, devoted less to, and um, it, it it's not it's not enriching. It's, um, you know, when you when you travel in in Europe, you see, you know, and pedestrian spaces are always stone or or brick pavers. They're never asphalt. Never, you know, pedestrianized spaces and. I don't see why we would be proposing a pedestrianized walkway here in a lovely location and have it be basically asphaltic paint. Um, so I don't, I, you know, I, I think it was indicated that that's sort of up to the trust, but I, I don't think that should be an option uh, to, to just leave that as, you know, painted asphalt. I tend to agree, David. I would like to see the, the, the park treatment be extended to the degree possible. Um, through that walkway. Um, Viren, did you have another comment or question? Yeah, there are two, two quick comments, and I, I agree with David, I think that's a good good point. I, it probably needs to be more like a boardwalk because that's what it is, it's, it's on the waterfront. So it really needs to be much softer and easier on the, on, on the knees kind of a surface. And I think boardwalk definitely makes tremendous sense. And the two other points that I want to quickly make, uh, what Christine showed was quite, quite sort of brilliant, but at the same time, there's a larger argument to be made. South side of Chelsea Piers, where you have expanded sidewalks and you see a lot more people walking around. But when you come to uh, Chelsea Piers, 
it dwindles, the numbers dwindle. You know why? Because it's not fun to walk in front of that garage looking like a building. It's not a very sort of, um, you know, what do you call it? Um, pedestrian friendly building front that we have over there. And Jesse, to your point, no, this, the new sidewalk or whatever you call it, it's not a new sidewalk. It's not being expanded. It's the same sidewalk. Only the pinch points are being released. And the last point that I want to make, Jeffrey's comment is actually on the dot, because yes, you're looking at this place 45 years down the road. And yes, the transport, mode of transportation are, are going to change. And I think we should consider potentially all the goods and services delivered from the waterway side and not simply just cars and trucks because hopefully we're gonna get more civilized over the next 40 years. So that's my oh, last comment. Hopefully. <laughs> Jesse, did you have another comment or I, question? I have a few more, yeah. So one, I would say, unfortunately, looking 40, 45 year, years down the road, Law & Order SVU probably will still be running. So <laughs> It's gonna, we're, we're gonna, they're still gonna need that service road. It'll be <laughs> Law and Order AI division or something. Yeah, like. it'll, yeah. it'll be some, some, <laughs> some spin off that they'll, they'll be there. Um, uh, listen, I mean, uh, I'm addressing this to David now. Obviously, you know, th this community board wants to see some, um, uh, you know, th that we're being heard in, in some way or another and that you're taking these concerns seriously and actually looking into the, the proposals that are being made. I came out and, and said from the get go, though, I really do think. Um, you know that that uh, the 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 expansion in the back really should alleviate a lot of the pressure on that sidewalk. Um, although it, I, I've you know listening to my my colleagues on the board. True uh, and no, yeah, true and but it still doesn't mean that we can't improve the front as well um, if it's possible. But we could have both. Yeah, yeah, and so it's just we just want to be heard and and want to um, you know make sure that you're actually taking these concerns seriously. And um, uh, just a couple other things, or one other thing that I just wanted to throw out, which is since we the bike lane is an issue in and of itself, not your issue necessarily, um, but you know it is heavily trafficked. It, that curve goes around, um, bikers swing by there. There, um, I could easily see bikers being very, very, very tempted to cut through the, the back, even though you have the "this is for walkers only" signs. But one, I'm wondering, do you have? Um, uh, you know, will there be other signs saying no bikes or you must walk your bike? And two, is there any going to be any way to patrol that? Because I could easily see bikers just flying by and, you know, and take Does that up happen now, David? Do bikers try to sneak through? Uh, generally, anybody who pedals their bike onto the site generally is going to the gym and comes in at a slow pace and they're a regular visitor ah, um, so you, you, you we don't have them. any we don't have any issues that i'm aware of with people traveling through at high speeds if we did we would stop them we have 35 people who work on our guest services team so and they're stationed yeah. at all the pedestrian crossing so yeah. they would stop them if they were unable we would contact the trust and they would uh fortify our staff for a week or so with some pep officers to um, make sure that behavior is stopped. And also, just so you know, you know, we've, we've coined the phrase, a park runs through it. So we're very interested in going with the upgraded materials if the, you know, once the trust um, sees the plan alternatives, you know, I think a lot of people are pretty enthusiastic about it. And we certainly are. Great. Thank you. Um, I don't see any hands. Do we have hands up from the public, Janine? Yeah, we have three. Oh, attendees. Yeah. Okay. So. Tom, Melody, and Wendy over. Okay. Tom. Or is Melody over now? Yeah, they should all be over now. Okay, I had to I had to unmute and find my way in. I'm sorry for the Not delay. At all. Um oh, I have several questions. One, uh, uh, David had mentioned that there were 300 parking spaces inside the facility. And I remember when we first uh, issued the permit for this facility, it had 355 right. spaces inside. Um, and I'm wondering, I, I didn't, see, I saw a plan of the entire pier, but no plan of the parking. Uh, I wonder if it'd be possible to see a plan of the parking and understand did those 55 spaces 
disappear? Or are they still there? Or was that traffic pushed out into the public space on that road? Um, that's one question. And two, uh, it was mentioned that state DOT determines what happens with the bikeway. But the property in front of the building um, in the original lease and currently um, can be taken for public use. And whether that includes um, narrowing, if you can narrow it down to one lane at, uh, when people are leaving to uh, um, facilitate pedestrian crossings and that's your busiest time, four to 10, then maybe it could be a narrower roadway overall. And I, I really think that the trust and uh, should look at some of the alternatives proposed like Christine's uh, alternative for the inboard, uh, for the front of the building, or widening the bicycle path because the bicycle path was narrowed from 16 to 12 feet. It was supposed to be 16 feet wide, but the roadways took away part of the bike path. I really would encourage you to look at um, reviewing those, the need for those roadways and alternatives um, for the parking. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next up, we have Melody. Hi, am I am I audible? I'm Mel yes. Okay. So, thank you so much for everything you're doing here. Um, Chelsea Piers gives a lot uh, and a lot of people love it, but as a pedestrian, I don't always want to be shunted into it. It's a bit of a theme park for me. Um, it's beautiful, it's great, but a lot of the times I just want to walk by it. I really loved Christine's design. I love the fact that I can have some kind of a park experience. To be honest, Chelsea Piers has a very suburban approach. It's parking lot first and then parking second. And then you go in, you know, into this interior space the way they do in Los Angeles and other kind of car cities. So the fact that Chelsea Piers has made this huge plan to uh, divert pedestrians shows how important it is for them to uh, keep this space for cars. I heard a lot of, you know, um, various modes of transportation. I didn't hear bus, I didn't hear jitney, I didn't hear subway, I didn't hear boat. It means cars. 350 parking places is too many parking places that can be used for something else. If you want um, secure bike parking, it exists. There's a company called Unipod. In meatpacking, they have just debuted, uh, a, a, not a prototype, more than the prototype, but it's a small version of it. There's also one at Grand Central Station. It's secure bike parking, it's free, it's really good. Um, I'm kind of curious about why this lease has to be so long and why Chelsea Piers thinks that this is the moment to, what is it about this moment that has to be kept the same? Um, I've heard Chelsea Piers say that um, the size of the vehicles for their productions means that they have to have these three, these three lanes, but I have just two words to say, music studios. Does anybody remember music studios? We used to have them. But then we found out we could do everything a studio can do on our iPhone. We don't have music studios anymore. So technology is, technology is going to change, disruptions are going to happen, and those three lanes should not be there for Chelsea Piers. Um, I really love riding around the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which has a huge facility, but it's, it's a generous pedestrian bike infrastructure. And even though I can't be on the water, I don't feel cramped. So, um, I have a lot of things to say and they're disjointed. I don't want to take too much time, but I really liked Christine's drawing. Uh, it made me kind of want to be there. Um, and I guess I would say not so fast. This is a long, long lease. Things are going to change. Not so fast. Thank you. Thanks, Melody. And now we have the other uh, public speaker was Wendy. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi, Wendy. Welcome. Welcome. First, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for letting me join in on this because I've been a member of Chelsea Piers on and off for years. And yeah, you're right. Production changes. I'm in production. Bing, bang, zoom. Production will change in the drop of a hat. I loved the idea of what Christine said about the front of the building being more park-like. I look at it and it's like looking at a warehouse and it's really uninviting. I loved that you were considering the 20th Street crossing making that easier. 
But my biggest problem is, and part of the reason why I no longer go to Chelsea Piers, I cannot cross, cross the bike paths safely. Most people will say, oh, slow down pedestrians, whatever. Most people ignore those signs. That's very troubling to me. I don't know what the solution is, which I, I, I'm hoping that maybe that can be discussed. I wish I had an idea. I don't, but it's really very scary. So when you're considering the front of the building, the 20th street entrance, please consider making those bike lanes somehow safe for a pedestrian to cross on foot. I'm a walker, not a biker. And thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Um, do we have any more hands up? I don't see any more. More hands. Okay, thanks, Janine. All right, so shall we wrap up our discussion of this important topic? Um, I think as a, Christine, do you wanna do this or you want me to do it? I'll try that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and just it's some enough. context, just some context for our committee members. Uh, I think the process, if I'm correct in this, is um, transportation is going to um, discuss, you know, we're going to discuss what we want to ask of Chelsea Piers in this process. And then um, Waterfront Parks and Recreation is also going to address this topic as well. And we're going to have a super combo mm -hmm. exec letter that that combines the work of both committees. Is that right, Jeffrey? Roughly, yes. The peers and trust are already in receipt of the WPE letter that we voted on at full board, what, a week and a half ago now. Mm -hmm. um, tonight's meeting will help inform public hearing discussion on March 22nd. Um, and then indeed, we'll have the opportunity to, you know, to sort of pivot from there. But I think what happens tonight will inform the hearing and then we'll adopt the letter accordingly at full board at the beginning of April as well. Great, okay. So, so the, the wrap up is complicated because this is a complicated issue, right? Um, I, I think what I'm hearing is, and it's not in any, I think we want to first remove obstruction. Okay, let's start with the inside. With the inside, I'm hearing that we want to have the pavement to be of higher quality and to be a required uh, enhancement. Um, they have proposed to uh, do the curbs cut and we would ask them to look at all the curb cuts. Um, we, uh, we want to relocate the film trailers to the east side of the road um, or replace with permanent facilities. And the reason I'm saying that is that the trailers, you have them, you have seen them on your street. The trailers have steps. And when they have the steps, they are taking out another three or four feet of the sidewalk. So that sidewalk is really obstructed in a major way. When the trailers are there, they should be in the middle. And, um, you know, we want them to study removing the parking lane and make a sidewalk widening. And we want them to do that as much as possible. Um, maybe the option is to do it in certain section of the road. Maybe it's not the whole length of the road, but at some portion of the road should be widened. And, and we would like to see that. We don't want them to remove trees, expand the tree pit, do a different surface. And I think that, um, and definitely we want bike share on this service road somewhere, okay? Uh, so all of those things. I think in addition to that, which is parallel, we may want to ask that they are regular uh, milestone in this contract. And that, you know, in the first contract was after 10 years, you renew and you have a new set of requirements. And I think we may want to have a milestone with new requirements applied to Chelsea peers after every milestone. Because, you know, as we said, it, this is like, 35 years without having an impact and a dialogue on how things should change. And I think that 
that should be uh, part of it as well as maybe, uh, you know, requirement of them every 10 years uh, so that we can continue to evolve. So that would be a, a general concept. And I don't know whether I missed anything. Um, you know, we, we don't want the, I think they are going to widen that and, right. I think that's what I have. Did I miss anything? I think you covered all the bullet points. Okay. Generally, Can I know, just, sorry. Yeah. Just two quick things. <clears throat> I think it's important that we note regarding the expansion of the Esplanade on the Southern portion, that needs Army Corps of, Army Corps of Engineer approval. So, you know, as, as much as it can be proposed, we wanna make sure that, um, it's gonna be a guarantee and we need the Army Corps to say yes to it. So we should definitely highlight that. Um, and then second, Christine, I, we want it studied. We want the narrowing of the service road studied before they make the decision to put the trucks on the east side of the roadway, right? Right, should, isn't our goal to narrow overall and expand the sidewalk? Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, if if tomorrow they were moving all these trucks on one side, the sidewalk would be less uh, encumbered. So I'm I was just mentioning that no matter what. But in addition, we want them to widen the sidewalk. Okay, so the the moving to the consolidation to the east side is a is a interim step one, basically. Exactly. Okay, got it. Exactly. Yeah, just a very quick point. I, maybe it's asking for too much, but the bike lanes on the east side, uh, potential expansion is something that should be studied. And since we are sort of asking for parking lane on, uh, on the west side to be taken over by the, by the expansion of sidewalks, we could distribute that width on either side of the service road, potentially, I don't know. Maybe it's asking I, I, you know, my view is, I don't know, I don't think we can do both. Mm -hmm. So no, because you know, they, they, I mean, they certainly need, need a parking lane and a moving lane, right? And those lanes are not very big. They no, are no, 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 well, Christine, Christine, sorry, I, I, I didn't mean take away two lanes. What I meant was the width of one lane, you might want to consider distributing it on either side. Some of it for the bike lane, and the rest of it remains on the west side for expansion on the sidewalk, potentially. So you I am not in, I'm not in favor of that because you have an infrastructure there and you mm. would have to break all the infrastructure to expand that. And I think the focus there was, you know, there is a passage for the bike lane. Yeah. There is practically no passage for the pedestrian. By, by creating the bike lane, the, the, the wider for the pedestrian, you're creating a path. Mm and you are equalizing between the two modes in a sense. No, which is, which is the reason, I'm not, I'm not right. insisting on it. What I'm saying is it's something that needs to be studied because if you ride your bike in that bike lane with sort of- um, But you remember that we sent a letter, we sent a letter to ask for the, the, the a lane to be taken from the highway. Oh, okay. okay. That, right? It's something to be studied. I mean, I think- So that, that should be part of okay. it. So I think that's, these are the, and, and you know, I don't know whether we want to say we request, we deny unless, I mean, I'm not sure. I think we should be urging very strongly mm. that the uh, contract be amended and uh, not sign as it. I think we need to take a stronger position and say deny unless. Well, I don't know whether we have, Jeffrey, do we have a, a deny? That's where, up, that's where our WPE letter ended up as well, right? That was I, after that came out. Okay, so we'll do the same thing. We'll do the same thing. It's a deny unless. Okay, so Dale, you want. Okay, so we have a, a motion. We have a motion. We have a proposed letter that Christina summarized on the floor. Um, can we have the committee members vote all in favor of this letter? Are we Aye. Yeah. Any opposed? Second. Thanks, Rob. Any opposed? Sorry about that. Any PEs? 
Okay. All right. So we will get that letter together and take And Noreen, away. congratulations. And what? Oh, no. you are now president, or did I miss that? <laughs> oh, it's, it feels like a very long time. <laughs> Thank and you. Robert, too, bravo to come back. Thank you. Welcome, Robert. David, thank you so much for your presence here and your presentations. And we look forward to taking the next steps with you. Great. Thank Appreciate you all. Thanks. We love Chelsea Piers. Uh, I just want to take a minute to thank the Transportation Committee, Chelsea Piers, and the Trust. Um, this is not our first time around the block on this issue. And so I thank everybody for allowing the discussion to be thorough, uh, to have multi-committees appropriately approach the issue so that you know, the CB can best have, a, have its most inform informed opinion as possible. So um, really appreciate everybody's time on that. So thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. Okay, next on the agenda, we have parking regulation change request from 305 West 48th Street. That's the civilian. Do we have somebody speaking on that? Yes. Hi, hello everyone. My name is Frank Herman. I'm the uh, assistant general manager at the Civilian Hotel. Uh, I wanted to thank you everyone to let us a chance to, uh, to speak. I uh, promise I don't think my presentation will be that long. Uh, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, so we are a hotel of 203 rooms. We opened uh, last November. We will have three restaurants. Uh, one in the ground floor, uh, on the second floor, and as well on the rooftop. Um, the reason why we wanted to be on, on that call is to basically um, ask for a proposal to uh, have a loading zone uh, that would be used not only for deliveries, but also um, for our guests coming in the hotel, as well as the restaurants, uh, including um, taxis that will drop off. Um, guest. So I had a little um, document. Can I share my screen? Yes, you can. Go okay. ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Here we go. <clears throat> one second. Uh, yeah, so um, there's the civilian, 203 rooms. Restaurants and uh, bars are not open yet. We'll probably have them by June. Um, the reason really it's for the deliveries, uh, dropping the guests off. Um, valet, we identified that about 30% uh, percent of uh, hotel guests are usually driving to the city now. Um, so the idea is that they will have this loading zone to leave the car, the time to um, check in and arrive in the hotel and then park on uh, the car uh, nearby. Um, we also are very sensitive about maintaining the streets clean and litter free. Um, we uh, recently met with um, the West 47, 48 Street Block Association. Uh, and we'll definitely want to be part of keeping the streets uh, as clean as possible and safe for uh, the pedestrian. Uh, and also, obviously, it's, I think that's one of the most um, important as well, avoiding congesting the traffic since it's only a one-way road. Uh, we feel like if there is no uh, loading zone, the delivery will basically um, uh, congest the traffic during Double that. park. What's the current, what is the current um, regulation at your curbside? So it was a um, no standing um, zone. That's what it was. Uh, it was um, preferred for fire guard um, because the caserne is just uh, around the corner. Um, that site actually has been in construction for the last, uh, I want to say five years. So, you know, we haven't been really taking parking uh, away right now, which have, with, um, we have already discussed with the fire department uh, that those, those, uh, those um, parking seats, parking place were not, uh, were not necessary. 
So this is the front of the hotel uh, at this uh, point, uh, and it goes all the way to, um, to here, which this is basically um, the entrance to the restaurant, and as well as where we will receive the deliveries. <coughs> what is the total length of the frontage? 50, fe 50 foot. You have 50 feet of on, on 48, what is it? Yeah. 48, 48 street. 50 feet by eight. That's kind of where we'll be there. Asking. And this is the other side. So lengthwise, I think it's about like three cars, um, but I'm sure you, you are very familiar with the truck uh, that delivers restaurants. They're usually pretty consequent and uh, it will be easier to maneuver if they have that, that amount of space. We feel like if the loading zone was smaller, we won't be able to park. So the current regulation for all of that 50 feet is no standing or is it mixed? No, the whole, the whole street is no standing. Um, further further, further um, to 9th Avenue, you have the Belvedere Hotel um, that has the loading zone. And then if you go in between and further out, uh, it just says fire guard. Same okay. thing on the other side. Okay. Is that the your presentation, Frank? Yeah, and then this is basically uh, what it would look like if, let's say, there is no loading zone. So then you can see the traffic is just really uh, congested and cars will have to far, wait behind it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is the sign that uh, the Belvedere Hotel has, who is um, nearby us. And so I think that's kind of the same sign we would like to have. Um, thank you, Frank. Uh, I see Christine's hand is up. Yeah, I have a question. My impression was that for every hotel above 100 rooms, you would get automatically uh, a hotel loading zone. Yes, that, I mean, that's, that's correct. Uh, but you still have to uh, make a request uh, to the community. And that's, that's why we, we, we requested to talk to the Street Block Association uh, to get their support. So we have the support of the Icon building and the um, 312 building. Yeah. And it seemed that a lot of support uh, in the record was passed to the co-chair as well. So you, um, what you want is an hotel loading zone, right? Correct. Yeah. That's very uh, straightforward. Yeah. yeah. Is that built? Pete? Yeah, that's me. Oh, go ahead, Pete. Um, it sounds great. Um, thank you for the coming along and uh, showing us what you you have in mind in terms of parking. Uh, directly, I'm sorry. Uh, directly across the street, there's a parking lot, and it's now uh, advertising uh, for uh, parking. And I, I think in the future, it's going to be a problem in, term, in terms of cars going into that lot and coming out. Uh, there will be a conflict. Okay, but, you know, he is entitled to a loading zone. No, I, I'm, I'm just bringing so that. A loading zone, and we are not discussing here the parking across the street, right? It's Right now, they're not parking they're not allowing for parking but there are advertising for parking i understand yeah so that later on might be a, a problem in terms of it being very tight so i right. want you to consider that when we make the right. uh, recommendations for the park i'd make a motion to approve yeah second, second. I'm, we have a I second, second. okay um to the committee all in favor of uh, approving this hotel loading zone in front of? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any present not eligible? No, nobody works for the hotel. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation, Frank. Okay, thank you very much for having me. Sure thing. Okay, next on the agenda is traffic mitigation proposals for 11 second street. For what? 42nd Street? Oh, that's me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Christine's um, so 
a, a few weeks ago, there was a walkthrough with um, uh, uh, with a Eric Butcher's office, and um, you know, um, DOT, Port Authority, NYPD. I mean, just like everybody. <laughs> and we walked around at the intersection of 42nd and 9 and 11 and 42nd and 11 is just a, a really horrible intersection because you have the traffic coming from uh, 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 11th Avenue trying to get in the tunnel right traffic coming from uh, the west side I mean trying to get in the tunnel trying traffic coming from the east side getting in the tunnel uh, so it's it's just very, very congested. So I made some suggestion there about rerouting some of the traffic to continue down on the west side and then come in at 34 and enter in the tunnel through the contra lane, you know, which goes from 34 to 40. And, you know, everybody said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. So what I'd like to do is send a letter to say you really have to, you know, study that and get on with the program. The second thing is that uh, we sent some time ago a letter to the Port Authority about the horrible traffic on 9th Avenue. And uh, I think it's time to re-up that letter and say, look, uh, the, the Business Improvement District has made some has, has hired some um, traffic, I would say pedestrian traffic managers, which are essentially, you know, cross, crossing guards. And the effect of that was fantastic, but it cost a fortune. So I think we want to send another letter to the Port Authority and say, look, we have seen, you know, this solution is really good, but it costs a fortune. Don't you have another solution or could you help the bid uh, you know, fund that. And that would be kind of a follow-up to the last letter. So these are the two things I'd like to send if you are all okay with that. Um, sorry. Go ahead, Jesse. Thanks. Um, so I'm just con on the, uh, the Ninth Avenue congestion, I know it's just gotten worse and worse over time. So it makes sense right. that there wouldn't, like, I mean, I know we already sent the letter, so I, I understand that. But on the 42nd, uh, street congestion. I mean, that's always been a met. We have we looked at there have been no traffic studies done to relieve that congestion or the no like no one's done any work on that. Like that's so yeah crazy to me. Okay. Well, yeah. nobody wanted to touch the issue. The big issue is that you have the U.S. Uh, the West Side Highway, right? And people are coming in. Yeah. And so you have really people coming in the tunnel from three directions, which is crazy, right? Uh -huh. Plus they have installed a bus uh, lane, from a there. red bus lane, right? And indeed yeah. all the cars are in the bus lane. Yeah. So we need to relieve that. And my thought was bring that down to 34th street, let them come around the block. Yeah, but right. isn't the third isn't going down to, I mean, not that I haven't, but like right. wouldn't going down to 34th street just increase the 9th Avenue congestion? No, because it's going down on the highway. Clearly, I, clearly I'm not. You're going to go I'm down. Not, I mean, people, if you arrive, if you go south on the highway, right, you arrive at 42nd Street and people make a left turn and there's a big sign saying Lincoln Tunnel, right? Mm -hmm. In this case, what we would do is we would go down to 34th Street. At 34th Street, you would have Lincoln Tunnel people would go to 34th Street and 11th Avenue and come reverse. Yeah, but they have to go 34th, then they have to go east on 34th, right? Yeah, and they turn north on 11. Wait. Because there so is a cross, go, there is a reverse to, lane on 11th Avenue to go to the tunnel. They wouldn't have to go to 9th. No, I know they wouldn't have to go all the way to the night. Wait, I, where is the turn onto the, I'm looking at the map here now, sorry. Where's the turn up? Where's the connection to the tunnel from? So they go down 11th Avenue, all the way to 34th Street. And then, sorry, what do they do when they hit 34th? 34, they go east. 
east on 34th. So like through and at 34 at 11, they turn left in front of the Javits Center. In front of the Javits Center, they turn left because there is a northbound three northbound lane there. It's two way there. Isn't uh, it? I need this street view. Okay. Okay, right. I understand now. Sorry, I don't mean to take up our time with me trying right. to. No, out. no, I mean, I'm sorry okay. I don't have a drawing or anything. Yeah. It's just, it's, this was just a discussion, a verbal discussion with, uh, with the engineers, and I want yeah. to be on record, you know. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, so that's it. I, might as well try it. Yeah. So, put my hand down. Do we have a proposal? To I make that motion for yeah. a letter on. 42nd and 11th and a follow-up letter on 9th Avenue. Right. Two letters. Correct. And we have second. a second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? P and E's? No. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Next on the agenda. So um, MTA announced a pilot program for protective barriers at three train stations. Um, these are uh, enclosures, doors for the subway to prevent accidents. And one of them is at the Times Square station on the seven line. So I, um, I also looked up the, there was an earlier proposal which was shuttled by our former governor uh, from 2019 to install these protective barriers at 142 stations, which was the count that was deemed eligible stations where they were feasible. It was an estimated cost of seven billion dollars for these um, <laughs> installations. So I think the the role of the goal of this discussion is to you know weigh in on the proposed pilot and see if we want to you know um, based on the performance of the pilots you know expand the the uh, the program. Well, Dale, I mean, you know, one thing we could do is if we were very intense on one of our stations, maybe propose that. Right, but determine where, is our, uh, where, which other stations in the district right. are eligible. And I guess we would have to refer, I'm going to, oh, wait, there's no chat. Uh, the, I, there's a document, there's an MTA study from 2019, which outlines which of the stations they identified as eligible. So obviously we would pick from their list rather than contravene their list and, and pick an, what, they, what they've determined as an ineligible station. Right. But I'm sure of those 142 stations system-wide, several uh, are in our district. Do we have, a, uh, Tina's hand is up. Yeah, um, I have a question though. Mm -hmm. There seems the report that was put out semi-recently or one of the more recent reports basically said that they're just, from what I read or understood, considering platform screen doors, basically a, they're trying to do a one size fits all and basically pointing out the problems because the doors are at different places. And I mean, there are many, and the, there are uh, uh, poles in certain places on the subway. So there's lots of issues with this platform screen door. Yet there are two other types of doors, including a rope platform screen door, which they do dismiss, at least that was my feel, because it hadn't been around or something to that effect, but yet it has been around now. And I'm curious why aren't all three types of doors being considered versus just the platform screen door? Can you outline the three types that you're referring to? There's the platform screen door, which is the what I envision. I am so not mechanically inclined, so please forgive me. Uh, the platform screen door, which is full height, which I always envision similar to like the airport door or something like that. Right. Then there's the rope platform screen door, which are literally ropes. And you can see them in South Korea and Japan, I believe, not in all their stations, but there are ropes and they come up and they come down. And frankly, they look a lot cheaper. 
And then there's the third one, which is an automatic platform gate, which is half the height. So there are three, yes, there are three different types. And I'm just sort of curious because we do have many different types of trains and I get it, there's gonna be issues. I but think probably they're leaning towards the most, the most, the solution that makes them the most, the largest, the most, the biggest barrier is because some of this is prompted by like um, incidents of people being pushed onto the platforms. So whereas there's a general safety concern that's ongoing and a lot of subway systems use these doors, there's also people are reacting, you know, to um, these terrible incidents where where right. commuters have been pushed into the into the um, my only, and I, I get that. My only point is, is, isn't it better to have something rather than nothing? Yeah, we can absolutely ask them for, you know, it's two that it's three years later. So, yeah. um, Viren and then Jesse. Yeah, and just a quick comment to what Tina was just talking about. And there are different types of uh, barriers that people have. The, the best one that worked, and we, we know that, would be fine at, and for the air train at JFK. They're full right. of they open right in front of the door or whatnot. Now, the problem that MTA has, from what I understand, is the different heights at, at different locations. And they want to try and standardize it, get it made off site, bring it in here and just install them. So they might have sort of tweaked their plan a little bit. But what they're proposing right now is slightly problematic, um, not tremendously, like Tina said, better to have something than nothing. And I think they're pushing for half height doors, meaning oh. about seven, no, not even seven feet, six, six feet or something, just the height of the subway car doors, which is what they're proposing. Mm. And the automated doors that it, their argument seems to be is that the platform edge everywhere is not conducive to actually installing something that's retractable. And that's the, that's the argument. They want to keep something very standard or across the sort of board. Um, so I think that it, what would help Dell is if there is a way for us to request for what models they're actually entertaining, that would be very helpful for a conversation. Yeah, we'd have to, I'm, I'm, I have that study open and it seems to be like a lot of the stations are precluded because of the disposition of the structural columns so close yeah. to the tracks. Yeah. Um, I see Rob has a hand up and Christine. My question is, do we have an incident report or does MTA or the MTA police have a report that, you know, we as a community board can look at and see what stations have the highest uh, incident of uh, pushes or accidental falls and gear it from that perspective. Uh, I know that they want to do uh, the seven line of 42nd Street. I think there was another one in our district, but if, if there's something that we could look over and assess and have a greater understanding of what actually is going on, I think that would be a good way to move forward as well. Right, the other two pilot locations are not in our district. One is Third Avenue on the L and one is in Queens. Sutphin Boulevard, where the where the air train connects to the E. But yeah, I mean, we can ask about um, uh, high incident locations. Christine. Yeah, my um, concern um, with the doors and this experiment is that the uh, MTA is already trying to get, you know, ADA access in all those stations. And I know that we can be, you know, casual and just ask for anything. But at the same time, we know that the money is going to take away from something else. So I, I personally, I personally don't think that this is a priority because I would want to see all the station ADA before we get too excited about that. But I understand that some, you know, 
uh, some people may, may feel not comfortable in myself when I am in the subway, I always put my back to the wall and I'm always behind the piles because I, I'm always very concerned about that. But I, I think that we, uh, uh, you know, collectively may want to be careful about what are the priorities and the, the you know, the MTA, they need to do the buses to go to the, uh, to the uh, uh, desert, the transportation desert. They need to improve all the bus lanes so that we can go faster. They need to do the ADA. They need to change the signals. And when I'm thinking about all that personally, that, that issue doesn't, doesn't come to the top for me, but I'm only one voice here and you know, everybody should, should uh, wait on that. I mean, I have a, I, I get the, I'll, 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 I'll weigh in afterwards. Um, Jesse, Rob, did you have more to say? Nope. Okay, I'll go Jesse and then you. Uh, I think Christine's point is well taken. I, I actually, I, I agree that we sometimes get caught up in the, the issue of the moment and, 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 you know, uh, rightfully so. I mean, these, these deaths are, are a real tragedy, but, um, you know, ADA, lack of ADA accessibility for subway stations is like absolutely abhorrent. And, you know, as a board, you know, as we, you know, we're so focused on trying to remove, you know, we generally have a, have a, a theme of trying uh, to, to get cars off the streets and people being less reliant on on above ground transportation uh, or private transportation. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, not having these subway stations uh, accessible to everyone is just, is just awful. Um, and all, all the other issues that she mentioned, um, and, and, you know, I would want to see like, I, I don't even know, I, I mean, have rates of, I mean, I know it's not just people getting pushed in, it's, you know, people, it's, it's suicides, which are, you know, always been around, it's the trash buildup on the tracks. I know that's a problem too, and that's a big part of the delays. Um, so, you know, I would want our, our approach to at least, uh, as has been said here already, you know, to yeah, take in account all the various options, um, if, if at all, um, and not just immediately jump to the, to the most expensive one. Um, um, because there are so many other priorities. Um, but oh, sorry, I, my thought, my only question was just going to be: Have has anyone seen any statistics that like rates of um, um, people getting pushed in front of the tracks into the trains, or or uh, people jumping, or have been going up over the years, or has this just been a consistent problem? Not that you know that necessarily should change our answer one way or the other. If it's been bad for a long time, doesn't mean we shouldn't take care of it. But I, I just, think what was Rob was saying, we need some statistics. Yeah, right? we need some statistics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we should certainly request like the criteria for making these pilot selections, and we know the criteria. We can we can mm -hmm. from, from the report the criteria for mm -hmm. determining which stations are eligible and which are ineligible. In fact, Baron sent me a link to a list of stations at, in the district that are eligible that was prepared by one of the local papers. And some of them are part of components of our major transportation hubs, Port Authority and Penn Station. And in some ways it might make the most sense for these installations to be in high volume, you know, transportation hubs rather than like, you know, 150 out of 350 stations system wide. Um, uh, I see Rob and Tina, and then I'll get back to Christine. No, Tina, no, no. do you have another? Did you have um, something else? Um, no, no, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, my hand's still up. If, if you could just pull it down for me, I appreciate. It. Thank you. Sure, Tina. Did you have something else? Yeah, um, just to answer Jesse's question, in terms of track intrusions, according from the NTA announcement, um, it increased throughout the transit oh, system. Beer. Sorry, it Go increased ahead. throughout the transit system by 20% between 2019 and 2021, resulting in 68 fatalities last year, just so you know. And the only thing I'm gonna add is I'm definitely in agreement with both Christine and Jesse in that in terms of ADA access, yes, um, big, big priority and looking at high volume 
makes total sense. Yeah, thanks, Tina. Biren. I was just like one, one other quick point that's sort of very obvious, but we missed that very quickly, is that when you have a full high doors, the subway platform that actually ventilated through the track height. So meaning in other words, there's no direct ventilation from mm -hmm. some of the subway stations. And that creates one of the problems, which is why MTA is looking at uh, six foot height doors and barriers rather than full height because then they'll have to provide air conditioning and you know how it gets in summer. So once yeah. you get this full height barriers, you're finished, you're cooked. Yeah, got it. There's somebody right. in the public here. Oh, thank you, Christine. I do see a hand up in the attendees. Miriam Fisher, can you bring Miriam over? Um, um, Janine? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little loopy on Sorry, give me one moment. Hello, Miriam. Did you have a comment or question on this topic, the subway doors? Miriam? Uh, Can hello. you see me, hear me? Yeah. Yes. I didn't know how to get uh, your attention. Um, thank you for making the meeting virtual. This is actually something um, that I've been very concerned about. Um, let me. I turned on my cell and my computer because okay. let me just get that off so we but don't hear As I mentioned to you, we're, we're just following the guidelines from the state. They're the ones that set the guidelines for public meetings. Um, I, I have been very concerned uh, as everyone has about uh, the uptick of crime in the streets and it's not just the subway, but it's been since the pandemic. And as we know, um, there was somebody shooting homeless people uh, you know, in New York and Washington, it's not just here, uh, but the concern, and I'm speaking as a disability activist who's a member of several groups um, that have not taken a position, but with our emails and talks, we think this is a terrible waste of money that will not have real effect. It's a larger problem of homelessness, of uh, mental illness, getting the right kind of help and the subways and on the streets and the money. And as Christine said, and I thank you, we're afraid that it's gonna be taken away from all the work we've been doing now to get uh, the subway accessible and have elevators um, in the stations and ramps. And uh, it seems like another scheme to assuage a lot of public fear and anxiety about going back to the subway. Um, I'm more afraid that there aren't people wearing masks and that's not monitored. And I don't like to sit next to somebody who's talking and coughing in my face and often get up and that's not monitored. They've had, they're sending more police into the subway. There were police on the same platform as the woman who was pushed to her death a few weeks ago by a person with a history of mental illness. Um, that isn't the solution. The solution is wider with getting the kind of help housing um, and uh, most of the disability community thinks that this is really going to siphon away the money that uh, is needed to make the stations accessible. The, the, there is another proposal besides the gates and it's uh, that I read about in some of the articles. I don't remember if it was in the city or Gothamist exploring a detection system so that the conductor can see if there's anybody in the track and give them enough time to stop if so somebody is in the tracks, either by choice as a suicide push, uh, running across because they dropped something. So there are other uh, schemes uh, to hopefully make this <laughs> another possibility that will be not as uh, expensive. And it isn't really, there's been um, in the media that they're doing this in London, they've been doing that it's in Paris. They haven't, uh, when I was more mobile, I've been to those cities, they're doing them in Paris in new stations that are now automated. It's very selective, it's not widespread. Um, we have an old system with the pillars, with different cars of different shapes and sizes. They say the weights of the gates would uh, not work in different kinds of stations. 
it, to a lot of people, it's like when they close the subways for 24 hours um, to make people feel they're cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. And then we found out it's airborne. We don't, most people, and I'm speaking now for myself since disability groups have not taken a public position, but just the interchange because I'm a member of several groups. We think it's a terrible waste of money. Um, so I think, I think we've got it, what? I think we, I think we got it. All right. We got. I was point. hoping that there might uh, be some letter. Um, what I testified the MTA in the next hearing. I'm going to bring that up. That would go to Janner, who is you know now the head of the MTA, saying that we question the efficacy and utility of spending the money on selected stations when it's a system-wide problem with crime and homelessness and mental health. I, I, yes, I, we heard you. Uh, so, Dale, I don't know, but my thought was maybe with all the questions we have, maybe we should have a letter which sends those questions to MTA. Like, you know, what are the different types? Why are you choosing one or the other? Uh, and what what are the, the criteria for the selection of the stations and where is the budget coming from because where is the budget coming from will help us assess whether right. it kind of takes away from other projects and I think I think that that would be my recommendation that we have a letter going out asking a whole bunch of questions sure. okay that's my motion for that letter I make that yeah, motion. That just a quick point, Christine, if I don't, if you don't mind my saying this. Go ahead. Uh, MTA has uh, actually published that study, that article that I sent to you to, to Christine and Dell both has a study, 400 pages study, which basically tells you why they don't want to do this. Right, but I mean, that's not, we don't want everybody, everybody doesn't want to read 400 pages and we should invite the MTA to come and to come to the meeting, you know? No, to, to, totally agree. So I think right. um, basically, right. we, we, but we need to state that we are sort of aware of that study, um, and yeah. some, it's not sufficient for us to make a decision about what should or should not be done. Right, right, right. That's right. good. Yeah, because Got then it. they would they would throw that study back at you. That's what my fear. Right, right. Got I it. mean, the three the three pilot locations. In fairness, I I tend to agree with all the comments, especially about this. You know. Uh, accessibility, the prioritizing accessibility, I think that should be in the letter. But the three locations that have been selected of the pirate pilots could be described as like high volume transit interfaces. They're not, right. they're not like, they're obviously not random selections. They're like- but Let's, let's. I mean, let's write the letter. Miriam, let's write we're, the in, letter. we're in discussion as a committee now. Thank right. you for your prior I, you, you, You're done, Miriam. I'm sorry. <laughs> so well, let's I can answer letter. what you just said because I read about why they selected them because there are different stations. Miriam, that's right. it. Oh, we need, to, we're, uh, we're we need aware. to close that thank subject. You, thank you so much. This is now a discussion for the committee. I appreciate your feedback. So Tina, is that a good idea? What I just said? Yes, that definitely sums it up. And you yeah. are going to write the letter indeed, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wow, Christine, that was slick. Whoa. <laughs> Whoop. <laughs> all right, so we have a letter proposed. All in favor? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what it is. I, so. I think we know what the letter is. Right, right, right. We, we'll is. circulate. We'll circulate anyway. It's, it's skepticism and priorities. And questions, right. And many, many questions, yeah. Right. And all right. Thanks, everyone. I, we didn't have any opposed. We didn't have any PEs. Nobody works for the MTA. OK. Um, the last item on the agenda. Very quick is a very quick discussion of the survey that was sent out to all of you. Yeah. So, we're planning on going broader. Right, so thank you very much for all the feedback. Tina and uh, Blake did a lot of work on it. This was really helpful. I put all the input in there. My thought is uh, now to send it to you guys again, but a real, now it's not a test, right? And I'd like to send it also to the exec and have a quick discussion at the exec, right, Dale? 
and then we can bring them up before we send it to the whole community, right? So they they are uh, fully aware before it goes to everybody. That'll be April's exact, which is like the first Monday in April, right? Yeah. Yeah. David. I have something on the new business, so I just didn't want it to get okay. forgotten about. So when we get to new business. We're done with the survey. Oh, we yeah, don't. Okay, so we are on new business. Okay. Um, I had uh, sent something to the Department of Transportation, and he responded very quickly. It was great, actually, about um, from 30... Third till about 31st, the bike lane is not really marked well or, or um, there's on really ninth, hard on to know. Avenue. On 9th Avenue, right, David? Correct, on 9th Avenue. Yeah. And on 30th Street, between, between 30th and 31st, it gets a little skittish. But, so uh, Dot told me that they're going to be doing something in the spring or late spring. In the meantime, unfortunately, it's in PD's jurisdiction to enforce um, that cars and trucks don't park there. And it's very random. Like once in a while in the morning, there are no cars and trucks there. But a lot of times there's cars and trucks there. And I've they're forcing that. you into heavy congested traffic. So I don't know, maybe we can get the community board to get the local precinct to monitor this, to enforce. So there's people not parking in this Badly be, marked bike lane. Uh, it would be. It would. Wouldn't it be traffic? And we would write a letter. It would to be traffic. PD. I was told it was PD, but it's traffic enforcement. So it's traffic, traffic enforcement. Okay, if, if we could send something to traffic enforcement, especially bad. And also, it's very hard when you get to thirtieth and ninth. And they've been saying this for years, but now that there's like a construction fence, it's even worse. Cars making that left turn. If they don't slow down, they don't see cyclists because they both have the right of way. Yeah. Both, I mean, they both have the light, I should say, not really the yeah, bicycles, but the right away. The bike is going forward and the cars are making the left. Yeah, it's been in this condition for a while now due to all the construction. We did write a previous letter to keep to for them to enforce the to maintain the bike lanes through the construction, but the parking. I've noticed what you're talking about, David. You know, also, <laughs> like for example, they cleared this up once I reported it, but there were like sandbags in the bike lane, which made things so narrow, it pushed uh, cyclists into like I, a, I've seen a drainage. Like and a drainage. Now, once I reported off this within two hours, transportation, uh, Department of Transportation had it cleared. The person I spoke to, she's very good. So everything was all cleared up. But in the picture, which was funny, I think you were on this uh, email too, Christine. They took a picture, there was a car parked illegally in the bike lane. And I pointed that out to them. And since I pointed that out to them, that pretty much for the most part has been- But look, like that's, going to be, that's going to be fixed in the next two months. So, you know, oh. I, mean, I would I would just, you know, forget about that. This okay, is so when they want to get hurt in the right. next two months. But the big thing for now, I don't know exactly when 9th Avenue between 33rd and 31st is gonna be fixed. They, well, I'm going to try to there. find out that because I know the guy from ESD who takes care of that. So I will, I will, um, I will take care of that. Okay. And it's really funny they direct. No, no, I will take care of that. I know. Thanks. In the last two or three days, they but can... I will take care of that. David. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I just, I just, just <laughs> I wanted a... to, to Rob, give do you. you have a... Do we have any? Yeah, I do. Have... Oh, okay. yeah, I, I, I want to bring something up. I, it was brought up a while ago, but um, Ninth Avenue, right about uh, rush hour uh, between 23rd and like 24th, um, because of the way the left hand turn lane is going on to 23rd from Ninth Avenue, it really backs up and it bottlenecks really bad. And there have been like some pretty close accidents from happening. Um, if the three parking spaces were taken out and the left-hand turn was elongated, it would really solve the problem of everyone backing up prior to the light who actually want to make that left turn in the uh, left-hand turn lane uh, 
prior to hitting 24th Street, like literally it'll back up from 24th to 25th just so they can make a turn. But if those three parking spaces were removed, they actually have a longer place to queue so they could turn and traffic could get around without it being all backed up. Yeah. Anyway, right. just a yeah. suggestion. Okay. Um, I have, Dale, I have some updates from things we've done before. Yeah. The, um, you know, we sent a letter on the lighting under the high line. Do you remember that letter saying you should do that? So good news is that they listened to us. They got back to us. Uh, they showed us some stuff. We still said we don't like it. And then we just had a, uh, first of all, so they fixed the lighting. I had a meeting with them, they fixed the lighting. The lighting is going to be much softer. I mean, as, as soft as it would be on a, uh, on a sidewalk, essentially. And then second, um, they are going to organize the planters so that we have lit planters on one side and then we'll put a screen on the other side. So I think this whole area is going to look the way we want. And I think that's a very good, uh, very good win. Very nice win. Great. And it's, it's going to be done within one year. So that's going to be yeah. really quick. I mean, it's a, the work, yeah. yeah, the work is underway. Right, right. So this is very exciting. Uh, so um, just wanted to share that with you that we have uh, followed up and it, it, it's really positive. And I'm hearing also that the upper part of Ninth Avenue is probably going to come through in the next two or three months. The, the, the uh, restaurants have been told, you know, that's where we asked that they, when they reinstalled the bike lane, instead of installing just the bike lane, they do a widening for the pedestrian and the bike lane. And so my understanding is that all the restaurants have been asked to move, remove their stuff. And so therefore that means that it's really happening. And we also got new news, something that we had negotiated a long time ago, which is all the, the, the pedestrian refuge on 11th Avenue from 42nd to, 40, to 57 are going to be built this year into concrete. So that's going to prevent cars to get in the bike lane and it's going to make everything much safer. So we've got a lot happening for us. <laughs> this is cool. Good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Right. I think that brings us to a close. So we have some letters to write and some um, more more battles to fight. And we want to send, thank uh, Jackie Lazaro of DOT who was replacing tonight, uh, Colleen. So thank you, Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. Yeah, yeah thanks for uh, having me. All right, everyone. All right. Thank you. There's a last minute hand. <laughs> I think the weather on Friday. What? Oh, Enjoy right. the great weather on, weather on Friday. Oh, it's supposed okay. to get up to the 70s. <laughs> okay. Janine, Janine, did you Thanks. say something also? I was just saying that there was a hand up, but they seem to have put it down. Today. Oh, no, that was, yeah, that was Rob. He already he spoke. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye, everyone. Happy St. Patty's Day.